Thank you for worshiping with us here this morning. My name's Nick. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, as we transition into our time in the Word this morning, I invite you to open to Romans chapter 5. That's where we'll be. Uh, But something special that I want to invite those of you in the room who are in 5th through 8th grade. Raise your hands. I know you're here. All right. We are starting something new today. Our middle school message time is going to be happening on Sundays in second service during the sermon time. And so at this point in time, middle schoolers, those in 5th through 8th grade, if you would like, you may be released to the student room. We're going to have some time in the Word, just some focused middle school time. And then we don't have to listen to this boring guy, right? <laughs> Kidding. Uh, but please, middle schoolers, 5th through 8th graders, head on out. And the rest of you, hope you have a wonderful time here with Pastor Chris. It's going to be great. I'm excited. <laughs> it really trying, will be. You're trying to make up right now. I'm trying right? to make up for the fact that you oh. said it was about suffering and it was going to be a rough day. So <laughs> that's on you. Uh, so thankful. All right. Uh, excited for the students. And uh, I got to see just the smiles on the faces when Nick just uh, reminded of them, them of that and uh, the opportunity they have. And so thankful for Stephen and for Nick uh, being able to pour into them at this time. And so uh, pray for them as you, you think of them here uh, right now. Before we jump into Romans 5 where we're going to be, and actually we're going we're we're to go through the entire Bible this morning. Uh, don't, don't be alarmed. You'll get out of here by 1, 2 o'clock this afternoon. It's all good. Um, some of you are like all about that. Um, hopefully you brought snacks. No, um, where was I going? Oh, I know what it was. Before we jump into uh, the text today, I want to tell you about something that I'm excited about, that we're excited about, something that we've been praying about for a while, and we started to uh, put it out there on a slide. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, Tim, if you would. Uh, you may have seen a slide, something like this. Uh, I love our city slide. I've been praying about this since uh, January-ish, and, uh, and even before that, there seems to be a verse each fall that starts to capture my attention, and it seems to be a guiding verse, whether it's public or personal for me in the year uh, that we walk through. And this fall, it was this verse from Jeremiah 29.7, which says, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And so this started to capture my attention, and I have it on the background of my screen in my office, and, and praying over this of what does this look like? I've always longed for our church, and we've, we've done a pretty decent job over the years, and we have much room for opportunity to grow, to be involved in our community, not just to be at the edge of our community, but to be involved in our community and to be giving ourselves away, not to exist just for ourselves, but to exist for the good of the community. And I love this verse because what Jeremiah is writing to is the Israelites who are in exile. So often, and so, even many of you believe that the church should be at the seat of power and in the center of society and, and have the authority and the rule. That's not what Scripture says. That's not what Scripture comes from. Is The church is the best at the margin. The church is best at the edge, speaking into society, not aligning with society. And so what he's saying here is you're in exile right now. Like the, talking to the Israelites there. You're at the edge, not this position of power. So what are you to do at the edge? You are to seek the peace and prosperity of the city, which I've carried, carried you to. So, so again, this is like maybe this radical concept of, wait, well, don't, don't you have to have all the right elected people and all the powerful people and all the business people to have the influence? No, 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 no. Jeremiah is saying, peace and prosperity, seek it where you're at. Pray to the Lord, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And so how do we help our city prosper? How do we invest in our city? How do we give ourselves away? Now, the vision that we have for this is much larger than what will unfold this year uh, because I envision multiple days of really pouring into really all areas and sectors of our community, um, just just blessing our community. But we're going to start off with some baby steps this year, and one of those is going to be March, or not March, uh, is May 4th, so it's coming up here pretty quick. What we're going to do is we are going to seek the peace and prosperity uh, to pray for our city. We're going to gather at 8.30 here for some snacks, some coffee, a gathering. We're going to pray, and then we're going to send out. And we've got just a couple projects right now. Uh, Some mulch that needs to be spread in one of our city parks, uh, some removal of a fence in one location, some garbage and stick pickup around the community and in our parks. And we're going to focus with this. We just have a couple projects. We're going to have some limited slots for each project because we don't want 40 people working on a project where only five people are needed. And we've all been there, and that's just annoying to give your time and then not have anything to do. So we're going to be intentional, so we'll have some sign-ups starting next week for a project that you want to do, that you're committing to. 
And then if you can't get on one of those lists, we'll have a waiting list and we'll find some more projects to do. But we want to go into the community. We want to serve. We want to pray. We want to interact and be a part of the community, seeking peace and prosperity and praying for our community. Um, so that's that. So I'm excited about that. And uh, you'll be hearing more about that. Next week, you can sign up. All right. Back to what we are here for today, Romans 5. And we have been walking through this letter from the Apostle Paul. He wrote to the church at Rome. You may think of the church at Rome of cathedrals and, um, and power and influence, but these were house churches. You think of small apartments where a few individuals would gather together, would share the word, would pray with one another, would share a meal. This is who Paul is writing to. And so he's talking to these house churches and he's reminding them of the gospel, the good news, the news that that Jesus came, that Jesus set us right. It's the God's righteousness through Jesus that justifies us by faith, sets us in the right position in God's eyes. And so he has been chapter after chapter talking about this. And then last week, we looked at Romans chapter 5, verse 1. It says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And we talked about how we are freed from our past. We're freed from our past rebellion and sin. In our present reality, we can have a relationship with God. We can have this wholeness with God. And then this ultimate wholeness, this ultimate peace in the future when we are in the presence of God in eternity. So when things are good, this is great. When things are bad, like, uh, okay, yeah, I believe it, but what difference does it make? And that's why Paul wrote these next verses to say that there is a difference that's made because of these realities. realities. So verse three says this, not only so, but we glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So suffering produces perseverance, So perseverance is this single-mindedness, it's this focus, it's this alignment, it's taking out what's not important and focusing on what is. So the classic example of running a race, you have a goal, you have a finish line, you are persevering through that race. But then he says perseverance creates character, produces character. And character is formed often in the crucible of pain. We can become bitter, or as the saying goes, we can become better when we have suffering. And we have probably bounced back and forth. You've bounced back and forth between these realities in life of this bitterness and then like, oh, I'm growing in this area. And you need both to refine character, to grow character because we are tested in these times in the sense of not tested from God per se, but we are tested in these times of who are we becoming? What are we becoming when we're faced with hardship? And then ultimately this character produces hope. The end goal is to hold on to hope, not wishful thinking, not I hope the weather is good, It is this confident reality in God's promises. And he says God's love is poured out through the Holy Spirit. So what Paul is saying is, it's not if you face suffering, it's when you face suffering, here's the path to walk down. Suffering, perseverance, character, hope. This is a growth path, a model. So some of you are just suffering right now. I don't want to persevere. I don't want any of this. Perseverance is that movement. Some of you are persevering, saying, I've been at this too long. What is this character-refining reality? And as your character is being formed, it's this holding on to the hope. Now, Jesus, with his disciples, as I mentioned, they sat at this meal. And Jesus is describing the reality of what is to come. And he says this in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world, you will, everyone say will, you will have troubles. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So Jesus is getting ahead of this, saying, hey, trouble is coming. I want you to know this so you're not shocked by it. I think we're surprised and and we can never be prepared when suffering hits us. But the fact that it hits us, we shouldn't be surprised by that. And he says, don't forget, I've overcome the world. There's victory, I've prevailed, I've conquered. So we keep this victory of Jesus ahead of us. And in that, we strengthen our faith muscles during this time. See, suffering can quickly reveal to us, am I trusting in myself or am I trusting 
in God. Someone said that suffering is the greatest seminary anyone can ever go to. So pastors, preachers, uh, missionaries, uh, uh, mission agencies, whatever it is, go to suffering to learn from the word of God. What does it say? And you read a whole lot of really great books and a lot of really boring books. And I learned a ton in seminary. I'm so thankful I had that experience. But I have learned way more in all the years of following Jesus. Way more. Through the highs, but even more so through the lows. You likewise. Some of you think, I just need to have more book knowledge. Well, in your suffering, there's an opportunity to know God like no book will ever teach you. However, we want things here and now and quick. We want things easy, fast, and controllable, right? For example, while you're listening to me, you can be on your phone ordering lunch. You can buy or sell crypto or stocks, whatever you're into. You can sign your kid up for whatever event is coming up. You can schedule a doctor's appointment. You can check and see what sports are on today. I mean, you could do all these things here and now. Easy, fast, controllable. But following Jesus is hard and slow, and guess what? We're not in control. But Jesus said, the burden is light and the, the yoke is easy because he's with us. But it's still a process that is hard and slow and often out of our control. And I want to tell you this morning is that God's priority is not to take away your problems. That may be hard to hear, but that is not God's utmost priority of like, oh, I see these problems here. I'm going to take them all away. It's much more complicated with free will and a whole larger conversation that we're not getting into this morning here. Rather, he wants you to be more Christ-like. In the middle of your problem, in the middle of your suffering, there is a refining that is going on. Paul is an example of this. Jesus, he himself suffered. And there's even refining there as he begged for the cross to be taken away. He said, not my will, but your will be done. It's just humbling ourselves. Paul's life was full of sufferings. In 2 Corinthians, he says this. Listen to his suffering. I've been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, bandits, fellow Jews, from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. There's some suffering there, right? A little bit, yeah, I heard someone say a little bit. And then this cracks me up, the last verse he adds in here. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. I'm like, yep. I love that. Paul's talking about all these things, and he's like, but my burden in my heart is for the church. Paul identified with Jesus in his sufferings. And he felt that God's purposes and his promises could be trusted. Suffering can mature us if we allow it. I want you to hear from a psalmist and also James who, I don't think they wrote these words on the front end of their suffering or their first time of really suffering. I think these words are coming from a place where perseverance had, un had unfolded, character had been, been built, and hope was being held on to. Listen to these words from the psalmist first. He says, It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn from your decrees. If you're fresh into suffering, or even if you've been in suffering for a while, this verse may be really hard to hear. You may not be saying, Ah, it was good. It was great. I love that affliction. I love that suffering. I love that hardship. But what he's saying is, here's my perspective, that I might learn your decrees. I might learn what you're all about, your heart. And then James said this, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. I wouldn't recommend saying that to someone who's really in the middle of it right now, right? Either that or just duck, like pull back, right? 
Consider it pure joy. What? Whenever you face trials of many kinds, well, wait, wait, wait. Oh, there's more. Because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I imagine those of you that have suffered and have walked through it, those of you that are suffering, for some of you, you've walked on the other side and you've been refined, you've been changed. That there's something that the way you see the world the way you interact with the world, the way you see other human beings, there's a difference that's been made. Suffering can change us. Again, bitterness or better. I think of a story from Exodus uh, 32. It's a story of Jacob. Excuse me, Genesis 32. It's a story of Jacob wrestling with God. So he uh, stole his brother's birthright, he deceived his brother Esau, and his brother Esau was going to kill him because of that. So he took off. There's 20 years of a gap of relationship, and, and now the families are coming back together. There's Jacob and Esau, and the next day they're going to meet. It's kind of like these armies are lining up for this conversation and reconciliation. And so Jacob that night becomes dark, and the story goes that he wrestled with God. There was this all-night wrestling in darkness. He wrestled in the dark. Suffering feels like wrestling in the dark. And at times it feels like wrestling with God. And so they wrestle and wrestle and wrestle, and then there is daybreak. Light is coming into the picture. And God's like, all right, it's daylight, I gotta go. Like the wrestling's done. I love what Jacob does at this moment. He refuses to let go of God. He says, no, 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 tell me your name. Who are you? And the conversation unfolds. And in that wrestling match, two things occur. Ultimately, Jacob lets go of God and enters into light, like this next season. But two things walked away from this time of suffering, this time of hardship. One, God touches his hip. And the rest of his life, he walks with a limp. If you've walked through suffering, you may walk with a limp. If you're walking through suffering, you may walk with a limp. That suffering impacts us. And experiences in life, whether it's something we do or others do, or a combination of both, it may cause a limp that you walk with in life. And that doesn't mean that you can't find healing and hope and joy again. But there's an impact because of that suffering. Jacob walked forward with a limp from his wrestling with God. And then two, God changed his name. God changed his name in this story. His name was Jacob, and he renamed him Israel, which gave him a new hope and a new future. It redefined who he was and who he was becoming. He could have gone back and been like, no, I'm Jacob, I'm good. I'm just going to walk with this limp. I'm just going to walk in this oldness and this darkness and the suffering. Now, God renamed him, and he walked forward and forever changed the history of humankind. There's this new vision, this new direction because of the suffering, because of the perseverance, because of the character, because of the hope that was unfolding. Jacob was changed. Every once in a while, I get to these moments where I'm like, where do I go from this? Because I just jumped way ahead intentionally. Uh, yeah. All right. Thanks for letting me process in, 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 the, in the moment here. Um, just live editing the sermon here. Let's walk through this. Let's walk through scenes in Scripture. Jacob is forever changed. I want you to keep that in mind of this walking with a limp, this change of name. In light of maybe what you're walking through or what you, you have, where you're at, when we look at suffering, we can hear the hope, the refined reality of the psalmist and, the, the, and James of consider it pure joy, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for this affliction. 
And that can be really refreshing to some, but it can also be very painful to others. It can be painful in the sense that you hear this and you're like, okay, there's this loving God, but this one that allows the suffering that we walk through, that seems like this like vengeful God that I don't want anything to do with. Why would, he, why would that happen? Why would he allow that? I want to say that that's not the way it was intended to be. And we want to walk, I want to walk through these nine scenes of Scripture laid out by Pastor Tyler Stanton. He said first, in Genesis, there is creation. This is the created intent of God. Genesis 1, perfect relationship between humans and God. There was no sin, there was no suffering, there was no pain. It was wholeness. So God told a story and he painted a picture. Then the serpent comes along in Genesis, it says, and painted another picture, told another story. And in life, we have two stories that we're told. God tells a story, and then there's other stories that are told. Like the serpent told the story. Adam and Eve believed the serpent's story, and they leaned into that. They sinned, which all of a sudden introduced the curse into humanity. And from the curse, this is where we have physical pain. This is where we have relational pain. This is where we have, um, even the ground is cursed. Like it's in the dirt, sin. It's in the air. It's just that like creation crying out, as one said in the scriptures. The original Intention was perfection in relationship with God, creation. What happened was the fall, sin. If you fast forward to the next scene, Genesis 6, we see how God feels about this brokenness. It's regret. He said this in Genesis 6, verse 5. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth, that every inclination and thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. And the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So we had created design, we had sin under the picture, and now we have God's grief, this regret. It ached. Because he's a just God who hates sin, but he's a loving parent who loves his creation. There's this ache. So then we see the heart of God in scene four. In Exodus 3, The Israelites are enslaved in Egypt. And the Lord said, I have seen, indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. I love this, is that in that passage, it was the the downtrodden, it was the poor, it was the broken, it was the sufferers that cried out, and God heard and replied to them. He heard. We fast forward 700 years. The Israelites are now exiles in Babylon. And we see God as a co-sufferer. Isaiah 53, which I read earlier, this coming Messiah, where they were to look forward to this coming Messiah just as we look back to Jesus. They look forward in faith, we look back in faith. And also forward too, knowing of the second coming. They knew that someone would come and would be a co-sufferer, that they're not alone, that God saw them, sees them, and would see them into the future. We know the name of Jesus, and that's scene six. Jesus comes, and he walks amongst humanity. Think of how Jesus came. He could have come at any point, in any situation, any scenario, in all of time. But he chose to come where he did. He came into a hard reality. He came in the middle of an infant genocide as an oppressed minority to peasant parents from a scandalous pregnancy. Well, you're off to a great start, right? I mean, he entered as one who suffers, not in a position of power and comfort and pulled away. He lived as one who understood suffering too. Consider how he he, uh, entered ministry, 40 days in the wilderness. Whereas Adam and Eve gave in to temptation, gave in to that alternative story, Jesus believed the Father God and believed his story and fought off temptation. Satan proposed shortcuts. And we so often in our suffering, our temptation, give in to shortcuts. And there's like, hey, I can, I can keep pushing through and trust God in this way, whatever this is, honor him. Or I can take this shortcut, which... I mean, it's, it's not really fully following God in this, but, but it's, it's, it's heading that same direction. 
Jesus doesn't take shortcuts. He is one who enters the story. He's one who walks alongside us, one who understands suffering, as Isaiah said. I mean, we all have the story of life that we walk in, and we're going along, and maybe we're following God in the story, and it's like, yeah, yeah, great, 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 great. And then suffering hits us, and then he died. And then the affair happened. And then I lost all my retirement. I mean, we tell the story, and then this happened. We have a God who grieves, who wraps his arms around us, a, a God who bleeds, a God who suffers. And Hebrews says this, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. He didn't take that shortcut. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And then we think about how Jesus died. He died on a cross as a criminal, publicly shamed, mocked, beaten, suffered. Jesus said in Luke 24, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things then to enter his glory? See, biblical healing does not mean taking away symptoms, does not it mean taking away the problem or the pain, but rather it's wholeness in a relationship with God and trusting him in that suffering. We see, too, how he lived again. He was a victorious warrior, raising from the grave, conquering sin, conquering shame, but also as this compassionate parent, taking it all upon himself. Scene 7 is the early church, Acts 5. They're called in for preaching Jesus. They are beaten. And then it says this in verse 41. It says, The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. In your household, or maybe you were this kid, did you ever discipline your child and then they just laugh? Or they just do it again? I mean, it's kind of like that reality is that the apostles are called in, the disciples are called in, they're disciplined, they're, they're flogged, they're punished, and they're like, don't speak of Jesus again. They go out rejoicing and praising Jesus' name. Yeah. They count it worthy to suffer for Jesus. As followers of Jesus, we are given a different story and have an opportunity to tell and live out a different story. Scene eight is the church at Rome where we began today. Suffering, perseverance, character, hope. The reminder that there's more to the story. That we are called as Roman eight, Roman, Romans 8, excuse me, I have my words here today. Romans 8, that we're called not only to the, share the glory with Jesus, but also his suffering. We follow not only the resurrected Jesus, but the Jesus who was crucified on Friday. We share in the sufferings. We share in his glory. Suffering, perseverance, character, hope. The final scene is a scene yet to come. That is a newness. There's a book that I read in college by Viktor Frankl. He was a Holocaust survivor. He wrote Man's Search for Meaning. He said that human beings find meaning in really three different ways. His work, love for others, and courage to endure suffering. In his book, he talked about how he would watch people around him. He said that something would change in their eyes. And that they would soon start to deteriorate and either die or be killed. But yet somehow he found hope and meaning in one of the worst places the world has ever seen. He was holding on to hope. He was holding on to something that was far beyond that current reality. 
He made a choice to control his attitude. What was ahead of him? He, he held on to, he didn't know if he would get out. He held on to something more. Author Steve Buckland, he said, when we don't have a why to live for, we are reduced to trying to protect what we have, focus on the past, and will only change to avoid pain. Our purpose will be reduced to trying not to lose what we have left. That's not any way to live. That's what Viktor Frankl was saying is there's so much more than just protecting what we have and just focusing on the past. There is this why that we have the opportunity to live for. We never choose our suffering, but we get to choose how we will suffer. Jesus prayed, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's this redeeming to brokenness that's possible. And in this ninth scene, this new reality, there's a picture that John paints in Revelation 21. He said, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. So once again, there's this renewal, this this redeeming reality of where it began with creation, perfect relationship, no brokenness, no pain, no suffering, no sin. There is this renewal that is unfolding here, this new reality. And it says he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. God with people, taking the pain upon himself. No more death, mourning, crying, or pain. It's all new. And this is the hope, not wishful thinking, the confident promises of God. So I want to encourage you today. Four words again. Suffering, perseverance, character, hope. Where are you at? What does your life look like? Are you just sitting in your suffering? You're just there. Be honest about it. To God about it. What are you feeling? What are you experiencing? Why? Just, just unpack that. Lay that before God. Or maybe you're in this perseverance reality. Maybe you feel like you've been there forever. Allow God to shape your heart, that endurance, that continuing to run the race, to keep going. And maybe you're here today saying, I don't think there's a tomorrow. And maybe that is going through your head that you're thinking of a way that there will not be a tomorrow. Maybe suicide is on that, your radar. I want to encourage you, there is another day. But to hold on, to persevere. Maybe for you it's a longer term of like, this season just seems forever, I can't get through it. I want to encourage you to persevere, to hold on. Maybe life, just this whole span, it just seems just persevere. Suffering produces perseverance. Allow it to change you. And in this perseverance, is, is not just to sit in that, just like, I'm holding on, I'm gritting my teeth, I'm making it through. This character-refining reality. How is God's spirit changing you, shaping you, molding you? What is he to want to take out? What is that thing that you're holding on to, whether it's sin or, or whether it's just something that's distracting to you? You want to give that he wants to refine in you. Maybe it's an attitude, an action, the way you communicate. Whatever it may be, I don't know. What is that? That God's refining your character. And as you are walking through any of these, hope. Jesus' hope. God's spirit working in you is hope. His promises are hope. It is this confident reality. We hold on to this hope. We keep our eyes ahead of us. So I just want to pause. And just give a few moments of silence. Is that, what is it that God's spirit is working on you? Is it a word, a phrase, a thought? What are you wrestling with? Be honest with it. So you just take a moment and reflect, and then I want to pray.
Jesus, I thank you that you have not left us alone. Lord, that you have promised to be with us through your Holy Spirit, that you've not forgotten us. Lord, that you know the realities that each individual, each household, each family, um, God, are walking through. And Lord, you're present. So Jesus, as you've heard the prayers, as you've heard the processing, the questions, the concerns, the frustrations, Lord Jesus, thank you that you don't run from us, that you call us to draw near to you and you draw near to us. Lord, you're not afraid of whatever we're processing, whatever we're worried. Jesus, I pray that in our sufferings, God, we would persevere, our character would be built. Lord, to look more like you, Jesus, and that we would hold on to you as hope. Lord, for someone here, maybe it's faith that they want to step into today. That they would trust you as Savior by confessing sin with in their own words, they're a sinner. They confess their sin and they receive your forgiveness that you bought for them on the cross. Maybe for others, they've been walking on their own, their own power, their own strength. And today's the day they want to tell you that they want to walk with you again as Lord. Lord Jesus, thank you that you meet us in suffering that is present, suffering that is past, suffering that's ahead. You're a redeeming God who does a great work in and through us. So Lord Jesus, may we be people who share our stories, who share our concerns, who walk with one another, pray for one another, carry each other's burdens, as Scripture says. Lord, help us. We pray this in your strong and powerful name. Amen. 